You guys are awfully awake for 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> Lots of caffeine. Yeah, well, you got one up on me then. They didn't have the coffee out when I went out this morning. So, are we ready to talk about some Ruby this morning? Yeah. Yay. All right. Uh, well, it's too bad. There's not actually a lot of Ruby in this talk. Um, this is a talk about taking a Rails application that started out on MongoDB and moving it over to MySQL. And I think we all know that there's not a whole lot of Ruby in Rails these days. So there's a little bit of Ruby, but there's also some other stuff. There's a lot of data, and I'll try not to let it take over the slides too much. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of storing it, ways of thinking about it, ways of querying it. There's a little bit of youthful indiscretion, uh, and there's some more data. And, but before we get into that, let me talk a little bit about something else. This is me in 96 point font, I believe. I'm Sarah May on GitHub and Twitter, and because this is a larger RubyConf than we've had before, and there's a lot of people here I don't know, this is Sarah Allen. We have the same first name. We work together on a lot of projects. We're both on the board of RailsBridge, which is a group that's working to bring more underrepresented folks into Ruby and also promotes Ruby as a teaching and education tool. And we also work on Pi, which is a DSL for simple games. Um, but despite all of that, we are not the same person. So now you know. I am a software consultant at Pivotal Labs in San Francisco. How many people have heard of Pivotal Labs? Oh, yay. How many people use Pivotal Tracker? Not bad. Um, many, of the, many people, probably not the people in this room, but many people are surprised to find out that Pivotal is not, in fact, a product company. We're mostly a consulting company, and Pivotal Tracker is our internal tracking tool that we developed that we released for other people to use a few years ago. So 95% of Pivotal employees don't work on Tracker, and I am one of the ones that doesn't work on Tracker. Um, instead, I spend all of my time doing Rails projects. And Pivotal does a lot of mobile these days, but uh, I pretty much spend all my time doing Rails, mostly because I just like it and I don't want to learn how to manage my own memory again. Uh, so, of course, since I spend my days doing Rails, uh, I spend my free time volunteering on another Rails project, because who needs that much variety anyway? Um, and uh, that project is called Diaspora. That's a picture of a stack of stickers I brought with me, so if you want one, let me know. I've got them up here. Diaspora is distributed social networking software written in Rails. And if the name sounds familiar, you may have heard of it because if about a year and a half ago, they asked for $10,000 for the four of them, the four people that started working on it, to work on it over the summer, basically ramen money, on Kickstarter. And they got their $10,000, and they got about $210,000 beyond that. And so they started working on it full time. And they've been working on it full time for about a year and a half now. Um, how many people have heard of Diaspora before now? Wow. Um, how many people thought it was dead at this point? You can raise your hand. You can be honest. That's all right. OK. I, I, I think that uh, that's pretty reasonable. The guys haven't been very good about talking about what they do. Um, but they've been making a lot of interesting progress. Um, so it was started, as I mentioned, by four students from NYU, these guys. And they were inspired to do it because they went to a talk called Freedom in the Cloud. It was given by this guy. Uh, anyone heard of this guy before? OK, yeah, this is, this is a free software crowd. That doesn't surprise me. So this guy is a lawyer. And as you can see from the picture, he's also a bit of a neckbeard. He actually wrote most of the GPL version 3 license. So that's sort of where he's coming from. And he gave this talk. He gave this talk called Freedom in the Cloud, in which he talked about the fact that when we use these free services that are available to us on the web, they're not actually free. We're paying for them with the data that we give to these companies. And it's not just our explicit data, like our social connections and our status messages and all that stuff, but it's the little bits of data dandruff that we scatter all over the web that these companies pick up and aggregate. And so in his talk, he described this idea for you know, what are the software tools that we need to make it so that there are alternatives to this type of service, so that people can continue to connect with people online and do stuff online, but not have to participate if they don't want to in these data aggregation schemes. So one of the things he talked about was 
we need a distributed version of social networking software, like a distributed version of Facebook. So these guys were like, okay, sure, doesn't sound too hard. We'll, uh, you know, we'll just go back, and they were looking for a project to work on, um, and they went back and hacked on it for a few weekends, and then they did the Kickstarter thing. Suddenly everything got serious. So the basic idea of a distributed social networking ecosystem is that you have different servers, we call them pods. So these circles are each different servers and you can make an account on any of the servers and then you can make friends on any of the other servers. And when you make a status update, it's copied to your friends on the other servers and they see it as if you were both participating in the same centralized social network. Now the advantage of this is that uh, you can choose which pod you trust your data with. So uh, what that means is that there may be pods whose terms of service do allow them to aggregate and sell their data. And there'll be other pods whose terms of service do not allow that. And so you have the choice of moving your account between pods to find one whose terms of service that you agree with. And if you're really paranoid, you can run your own. So uh, when they started working on this, they made a couple of technology choices early on. The first one was Rails. It's, you know, it's kind of a bit of a no-brainer, I guess. These guys, had, a couple of them had had an internship where they had done some Rails, and it seemed like a better choice than the Java they had done in their classes. Uh, then they made another technology choice that was a little more interesting. They decided to use MongoDB as their backing data store rather than something like MySQL or Postgres. And um, talking to the guys after the fact, there were basically two reasons that they did this. First one is this, and uh, I put this in quotes. A lot of people say this, especially on Twitter, I think. Uh, but you can find blogs and everything. There's a lot of people who talk about the fact that social data really isn't suited to a relational database because it's some, in some way not relational. We'll come back to that. Uh, and the other reason that they chose it, <laughs> basically that. And I make fun of them a little bit, but I think that actually both of these things are sometimes, sometimes legitimate reasons to make a technology choice, right? So this one, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a project, you don't have a lot of experience, you go and do some research, you ask some people you know, and this is what they say. There's not a whole lot you can do with that. I think that, that they made the best decision they could at the time. And this, you know, it started out as a hack night project, basically, right? And that's the place where you want to use all these toys. That's the place to take all of these things where you're like, okay, I haven't done this in a real project, but I want to play with it. And that's the place to do it. And, and I don't think any of them were ever expecting it to become as serious as it did. You know, they did this Kickstarter thing, and then all of a sudden they had 500,000 people on a mailing list waiting for invitations to the service that they hadn't built yet. It's a lot of expectation. So I want to talk about a couple of different things that we found in the process of building this out on MongoDB. And there were two major sets of sorts of mismatches that we found. The first was at the data layer. So the data that Diaspora generates, social data, uh, is not, in fact, terribly well suited to a document store. Uh, the second was at the mapping layer. We were using Mongo Mapper, and I'll talk a little bit about our experiences with that. And the third thing I want to talk about is the mechanics of how you actually do a migration between MongoDB and a SQL store. So we'll start with that. So let's talk about what MongoDB is a little bit. Uh, how many people here have done a project with Mongo at some point? All right, now keep your hands up. How many people are still doing a project with Mongo? <laughs> One goes up that wasn't up before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Well, then we should go out and have a drink later, I think. <laughs> um, so MongoDB is a document-oriented database. And what that means, essentially, is that rather than storing your data in tables, it stores it basically in what looks like a big JSON blob. So I'll show you what that means. So let's say you have a set of relationships that looks kind of like this. This is similar to a project that we had come through Pivotal uh, that used Mongo. It was actually a really good fit for Mongo. So we had uh, a set of TV shows, TV shows have many seasons, seasons have many episodes, and each episode has many reviews and many cast members. And the way this site worked is that someone would come in 
to a page for a TV show explicitly because they were there to drill down into the seasons and episodes for that TV show. So it was important to be able to pull out all of the information for a TV show at one time. So there's a number of ways you could think about representing that, right? In a typical relational store, each of these boxes would be like a table, right? So you're looking at a several, you know, a five table join to get all of the information out that you want, which is not a big deal, really. Um, but another way to think about this data is to think about it sort of like a set of nested hashes, which is what you think about it in Mongo. So this is, the ex this is an example document for a TV show. Um, and Mongo thinks about any time you, in SQL land, you hear row. In, my, in Mongo land, you think document. So this is a document that represents a single TV show. It's got some metadata up at the top. Uh, and then it's got a set of seasons, uh, an array of seasons with the square brackets. And each season is itself an object. So it's a hash of, with metadata, like the season number, and then a set of episodes. And within the set of episodes, metadata, and then a couple of sets of things within that. So it's sets of sets of sets of sets, and it's all in one document. And so you can pull back this entire document with one query. So you might think, actually, let me go back to that for a moment. So um, social data actually looks a lot like this on the surface, right? Uh, when you come to a, a social networking site, here's a screenshot uh, of Diaspora. There's a bunch of stuff going on here, and there's a bunch of queries we do to get all the stuff on this page, but there's really only one important query, right? And that's the one that brings back your stream, the one that gets the posts, the posts that have photos, that have likes, that have comments, et cetera, et cetera. So there is sort of a nested structure. Oops. There's a nested structure of data here that looks kind of similar to what we were looking at with the TV shows. So it's slightly more complex. Um, Users have friends, friends have posts, posts have comments and likes, and actually that's a typo. Each comment has one commenter and each like has one liker, right? So it's not, it's not a whole lot more complicated data-wise, or like relationship-wise, than, uh, than the TV show example. There's one really important difference here, though. If you look at something like this, oh, and here's what, so here's what, uh, here's what you might think about in terms of what a document for a user's stream might look like. Got the name of the user. User has friends, a set of friends. Each friend has a set of posts. Each post has some metadata and then a bunch of sets of other stuff, right? So similar to what we were looking at before. But if you're looking at this TV show example, there's one key way in which it's, it's quite a bit simpler, and that is that none of these objects reference any of the other objects, it's, except for one way, right? These, these are strictly one-way relationships. But if you look at this, you realize that all of these things are the same object, right? So user has friends, but the friend may themselves be a user, or they may not because it's a attributed system. But that's a whole layer of complexity that I'm kind of skimming over. And same way, commenters and likers may also be users, right? So uh, when you're looking at something like this in a document store, you've got two ways that you can approach it you can either denormalize all of the user data that you need into every single document and then keep it updated every single time it changes, or you can store references to the other objects. Uh, and so, and when you're looking at this, like, there's really not a whole lot here that has that type of complexity, right? There's no need to store other objects and everything can just be denormalized. Your entire query can be denormalized into one thing, one document. Um, but here, there's a lot of links in between objects, right? So when you come onto a social networking site, anytime you see something that looks like a name or a picture, you expect to be able to click on it and go see that user, right? Go see their profile, go see their posts. In a TV show application, it doesn't really happen that way, right? You're on an episode one, season one, episode one of some of Babylon 5, you don't expect to be able to go and see season one, episode one of like General Hospital, right? Like there, there's no links between the documents necessarily. But here there's a lot of linking between the documents and it's inherent in what social data is, right? Because it's all about who's doing it and what is your relationship to them. So our original document, for the stream query, looks something like this, as I said, with a name and posts and all that stuff. 
So we basically replaced um, the information about friends with references to the user that was that that represented that person, right? So a reference rather than denormalizing the data. Um, and Mongo uses BSON IDs, which are sort of like GUIDs rather than auto increment primary keys, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. But so you store a user ID rather than storing user information. So, and that's you know it's not a big deal, right? We're used to storing references to stuff. But the problem with that is that Mongo doesn't really provide a way to do joins. So you end up with code in your application that does it for you, right? So you pull out the stream query, and then you have to do another query to pull out all of the information for the user IDs for the, um, for the references that you have. So there's no way to do that in one query. You end up doing multiple queries and doing the joins more or less manually in your code to get the information that you need. So it was at this point that we kind of felt like code that was supposed to be under the hood and hidden was out in the open and in our application code. And it was at this point that we realized that that was a sign. And that at the moment that you start storing references to other objects in Mongo, that's a sign that your data actually is relational, that there's value to that structure, and that you may be going against, a little bit at least at first, going against what MongoDB has in mind. So there's two things I learned from this. And the first is that when people say social data isn't relational, that's not actually what they mean. This is actually what they mean. <laughs> what they mean is that, and they're right, right? You look at that structure, there's a, you're joining a lot of tables to get all that information, right? Uh, but that is, in many ways, a separate problem, right? The, the solution for that is denormalization, also known as caching. And you can cache into something like Mongo. And people are like, oh, I'll just use Mongo, and my database will be my cache. And then I can scale. And uh, the problem with that is that databases and caches are very different things, and they're good at different things. And you really, really don't want to conflate them. The other thing I learned is that when MongoDB tells you that they're about documents, you should believe them. And when they, when they say document, they mean, in many ways, they mean like something that you can print out on a piece of paper and hold. It's a sort of self-contained piece of information. And it may have a lot of internal structure. It may have headings and subheadings and paragraphs and footers. But it doesn't have, it doesn't have links to other things. It doesn't have references to other things. It's a self-contained piece of structured data. And so if your data looks like that, then it's a good use case for Mongo. If it doesn't look like that, then your data, it's probably not a good use case for Mongo. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about our experiences using Mongo Mapper, which is actually quite uh, a nicely written piece of software, despite all the problems I'm about to tell you about. Uh, I call it sort of, it's kind of like faking it, right? So Mongo Mapper gives you a data mapper-like interface to Mongo, which means it gives you a relational-esque interface to a document store. And there's a lot of problems with that, right? Because they are con conceptually very different ways of storing data. And what that means is you get methods that you think you know how they work because you know how they work in Active Record, but they work just slightly differently in Mongo Mapper world. And so there's a bit of a, especially if you're, and I think probably the more experienced you are with Data Mapper and or Active Record, um, the bigger the mismatch because the more you, think you know about how stuff should work, and the more surprised you'll be when it doesn't work the way you exactly expect. Um, so faux relational interface, bad. Um, Mongo does have a very nice JavaScript-based MapReduce, um, which is a very nice way of querying, although you should never do it on your master database, because it'll spike the hell out of your CPU. Um, but there's a couple of problems with using it. One is it's very low level. So you'll end up writing a lot of JavaScript to do things like count your objects, which you would think would be pretty straightforward. Um, and it, it is. I mean, it's straightforward in MapReduce land, too, but it just feels like a piece of JavaScript that I should not need to test out and write. And the other thing uh, that was more of a deal breaker for us was that it's really much more difficult to test. So you can test your JavaScript MapReduce stuff using 
Jasmine or some other JavaScript unit testing framework, but since they don't run with the rest of your RSpec tests, having it's a little bit of extra overhead, right? Um, so in general, some of the problems we ran into, uh, there's a lot less documentation available for Mongo. So we would run into problems like calling create on an, a class would create the object and return true, um, but sometimes it wouldn't create the ID for you. That would never happen in active record land, right? Uh, if something failed to create, it failed to create an ID, it would not return true. And this wasn't actually a bug in the software, but it's just sort of a mismatch between the way that Mongo thinks about IDs as sort of vaguely optional, right? Um, and, but it's hard to find documentation about this kind of stuff. Um, if I were not being charitable, I might suggest that Tengen's business model is to sell consulting services related to MongoDB, so it may or may not be in their best interest to provide good documentation. Um, but actually, I think it's just that there's a lot fewer people using it. So there's a lot fewer sort of official documentation, but there's also a lot less unofficial documentation. I mean, the way that I find out anything in Rails really is looking at some blog post, right? But uh, there's so much, there's a lot fewer people using Mongo and Mongo Mapper, and it's much harder to find information about things that you run into. Um, and both of those are a manifestation, I guess, of having a smaller community. So there's often no one in IRC available to answer questions. There's fewer forums. There's fewer all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and it also meant that we were often, in more than one case, the first person to run into a particular bug, either in Mongo Mapper or in the, the driver between Ruby and Mongo, um, which has never once happened to me working on Rails. I have never once been the first person to run into a bug in Active Record. Um, just because there's so many more people using it. it. just By the time I get into work at 9 o'clock and upgrade the patch level, someone else in some other time zone has already reported it, right? And I can Google and I can find it. Uh, but, you know, as a company that, you know, Diaspora was a fairly resource-constrained startup, and they're not in the business of, they don't really want to be on the bleeding edge of, of ORM technology, right? That's not what we want to spend our time doing. Less gem support was a big, big problem for us. So, you know, we started needed to start uh, doing background jobs. I was like, okay, well, I'll just use Rescue. Oh wait, Rescue doesn't support Mongo Mapper. Um, or it was delayed job that we wanted to use at first, and delayed job didn't use Mongo Mapper. Um, we wanted to start processing images. We use Paperclip. I've used it on eight out of the last nine Rails project I've worked on, but it doesn't support Mongo either. Um, and there was always a, a fork or someone's branch somewhere that supported it. And so it was never a problem of not being able to use things, but it was, it was just a problem of finding the right fork and then having your gem file get littered with references to particular SHAs on GitHub that we needed to use rather than using the standard set. Bugs didn't get fixed on the branch. Sometimes it got fixed on the main line and so on and so forth. Um, so it made other stuff, it's sort of the, the difficulty that we had with the ORM bled out into other parts of the Rails application. Um, and the big problem here, which compounds all the problems above it, is that the developers really didn't have a whole lot of experience with Mongo. So, um, and maybe the, uh, and none of these things are a deal breaker in and of themselves, but they were all compounded by that issue. So I wanna talk a little bit about why we switched. And it has to do with you know, the data mismatching is not really a good enough reason, right? What it comes down to is development friction. Um, development friction is something we think a lot about at Pivotal, and these are little things that you don't really notice but slow down your overall velocity. That if you fix them, you can sometimes get big wins. Um, and on this project, Mongo is just a constant source of friction. It made everything harder. It slowed our velocity down in, like, on, no matter what we were trying to do because everything in Rails, when it comes down to it, is about data in some way. And so everything was a little bit different. And everything was slightly non-standard. And as, as a startup, um, we can't afford to, to have, uh, to, take, to make these choices that slow down our ability to iterate quickly, right? Our lifeblood as a, as a startup is our ability to move fast. 
And if you look at all of these things, like none of these are, none of these are huge problems. These are not problems we can't overcome. But over time, they significantly slow down our ability to actually make progress. You know, in this, in this picture, right, we're this guy. Right, you can, you can think of the cruise ship as Facebook or Google or whoever you like, but our, our single competitive advantage is our ability to move quickly and get out of the way and take advantage of things that the big guys are too slow to be able to get a hold of. And that's the only way to compete against companies that can throw an entire building full of engineers at any problem they want. And so anything we do that, that reduces our ability to do that is reducing the, the likeliness that our company will still be around in a few months. So I put this in big letters because this was like a fairly important learning for us, which is that every non-standard technology choice we make reduces that ability to iterate and reduces our ability to compete. And there are organizations where that's not the case, right? There are organizations where it doesn't matter that much whether you're able to iterate quickly. And there are projects I've been on at Pivotal, for example, where we're not there to help them iterate quickly. We're there to help them uh, refactor and reorganize their code and leave it in a better place than we found it. And so there's different sets of constraints in different projects. But for a small startup, this is the one that's important. And so, you know, sometimes things will be worth it and sometimes they won't, right? Non-standard technology choices that reduce that ability to iterate are sometimes worth it. It depends on the, depends on the thing. Someone could, for instance, a friend of mine was like, when he saw these slides, was like, well, Rails is a non-standard technology choice. And I said, okay, yeah, I guess you could, you know, depending on where you work, you might say that. Um, but Rails actually has significant productivity gains that offset the fact that it's, for example, his example was it's harder to deploy than like a war file, right, a Java application, which uh, in, the, in the age of Heroku is arguable, but, you know, uh, he may or may not have a point there. But I think that uh, the other productivity gains of Rails offset, right? So it's just a calculation that you need to make. And at Diaspora, I think we should have made that calculation explicitly a lot sooner than we did. So at this point, I'd like to take a deep breath and out. This is the view from my in-laws dock in Marin County, California. And when I have to think about all this stuff, sometimes I like to come out here and sit with the ducks, look out at the water. Okay, so those are the problems we ran into trying to use uh, Mongo and Mongo Mapper. And now I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of of how we actually did the migration. So there's two things that you should know about a large scale data migration, having done a bunch of these in the last couple of years. And, that, and the first one is that it always takes a really, really long time. So you should start it as soon as you feel like it's something you're gonna need. And the other thing is, it's really important to get it right the first time. Because once you go into production, you actually do the migration, it's often very hard to roll back without data loss. So it's really important to get right. And uh, these sorts of things make me really nervous. And the way I react to this sort of nervousness is that I, I write a lot of tests, basically. So I want to talk about how you test drive a migration. The first thing I'm going to do is put air quotes around test driving, because it's, it's not really test driving in the traditional sense. It's more like herding, maybe. Because uh, here's the process that we went through, and this is the easy way that you should do if you possibly can manage it, which should be fine for 95% of your tables. So the first thing we did was test drive the conversion of a single sub-document from the JSON representation to CSV. And we actually used a command line tool called Mongo Export, I believe, to dump it into JSON and then run a conversion script to convert it from JSON to CSV. And then we test drove the import of that CSV into Active Record. And it was much easier, it's much easier to do it in two steps that way than to sort of drive it from the perspective of now, first it's in Mongo, and then I want it to be over here in Active Record. It's much easier to split it into two steps because there's going to be different challenges on each side. So then you run that on the copy of the production database, and there's an asterisk there that I'll get to in a moment. And then inevitably what happens is you add more test cases because once you run it on real data, you discover a lot of problems that you didn't realize, especially because you're moving from a 
a data store that does not care about um, or does not care as much about referential integrity to one that really, really, really cares about it. Uh, you will find cases where IDs don't exist, where IDs don't match up, um, other exciting things like that. And then you repeat three and four until you can do a conversion of that particular table in an acceptable amount of time. There's a step zero here actually that I didn't mention, which is that you need to decide how much downtime is acceptable for your site. When we did this, we were alpha, alpha, I guess you could say. So, you know, a day or even a weekend worth of downtime was acceptable. In other situations, that won't be the case. And a lot of, of, of how you do this is driven by how much downtime do you think you can stand? And actually, it turns out that we had about two hours of downtime in the end, which was a lot less than we thought. So that asterisk on step three. Uh, sometimes when you do this, you're going to discover that for whatever reason, whether it's because the data is very complicated or whether it's because there's a lot of it, that this, uh, this process, the easy way, is not possible to do. So in that case, there's a couple of ways that you can deal with this. And usually this is, we had one or two tables, uh, I believe, where we had ran into this problem. Uh, the first thing you can do is, is batch insert an active record. So the straightforward way of doing it is just take a CSV, make an active record, object out of each one of them. Uh, and originally what we did was we put the transaction around the entire loop. Uh, the problem with that is that, of course, that means that everything gets put into memory before it gets transactionally committed at the end. And if you have 600,000 rows, that may be an issue. So you can batch it. There's, we found that it depends on the memory footprint of the machine you're on as to what the ideal batch size is. Um, we found it somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000. Uh, there's a gem called Active Record Import that makes a lot of this easier that I highly recommend. Uh, and we ended up using some load data in file, which is just something that takes a CSV and puts it directly into the database, bypassing all active record. And the main problem with this actually is that it's a bit difficult to test because load data in file operates outside of active records transactional fixtures, which means that it's, uh, you're, it's, you're responsible for cleaning out any data that gets put in there during your test, which can be a little bit like, what? I need to do what now? Um, so there are some gotchas that you're going to run into. The first one is character encoding. Um, Mongo doesn't care particularly. MySQL really, really cares. Uh, so does Postgres. So a lot of this was just figuring out what are the right collation settings for MySQL and what are the right uh, character encoding settings for MySQL and make sure all the magic comments are at the top of every file. And we support both Ruby 1.8 and 1.9, so we also had some interesting like things that happen on one and not the other and vice versa. It was great. The other main thing is converting IDs. As I mentioned, so um, Mongo uses these BSON GUID looking things, which are strings. Uh, and the first thought we had was, well, we'll just put them in there and use those as the primary key, except they're strings, right? <laughs> you don't want a primary key that's a string. So, uh, but you kind of need to have them in there, at least initially, because you need to set up all of the foreign keys into other tables. Uh, so what we did was we, um, on every table, we had another column that was like legacy Mongo ID. And then we set up the foreign keys using the regular primary keys, but re you know, by, by looking at the Mongo, uh, legacy Mongo IDs. And then when we were done, we just deleted that column. Uh, and the other problem is character encoding. <laughs> You'll run into more character encoding problems if you have any kind of, of international data. And we have a lot of international users on Diaspora, which I guess made it so that we had to bulletproof it quite a bit. So, uh, of course, because this is open source, you can have a look at how exactly we did this conversion. Um, that's the code on GitHub, and that's the tag where we have the conversion code. I think we've ripped it out since then. So if you uh, just clone the repo, you won't find it, but the, go and look at that tag. Um, and let's see. I think that's it. That's all I have. So this is Diaspora. This is me. Um, I have stickers and invites, and I may have time for questions, a few questions, if anyone has one. I know it's kind of early. Yes? Can you like fit our Neil within uh, Neil or the um, alternative for the data store? So the question was whether we considered Neo4j or other alternative data stores. Um, 
We're considering them now as a way of caching data, but because of all of the overhead of using a, a non-traditional data store as your primary data store, we never really considered using it as the primary. Um, we, the way we look at it is that we have one set of, of, of canonical data, and then we'll probably end up caching it in a number of different ways. Um, at the moment, we're using a lot of memcached, uh, but we'll probably end up, we may actually, con we're considering actually bringing Mongo back for a few things, possibly for caching, but not as a primary data store. Yes. So if I'm understanding it correctly, the question is how do you how do you evaluate how standard a technology is and how it will affect your velocity without, without trying it? Um, that's a good question. I think that that the way I think about it is that uh, if I haven't tried it, then I probably don't want to use it in production as the first thing I do. Um, so Generally, how I approach it is, if there's something I'm interested in, I think it might be useful, I'll try some other project with it, some side project. And I'll try and figure out, you know, go into it with this idea of, okay, can I use this for X? Does it feel like it's useful? Um, and even then, I, I try to take into account the fact that the first time I use something, I'm really not gonna probably understand it very well, right? I need to do a couple of projects. I'm the type of person where I need to do a couple of projects before I start seeing the patterns come out. So for myself personally, the way that I look at it is if I haven't used it in a few different projects, I'm probably not going to put it on a project where speed is of the essence because that you're really, I feel like that's increasing the risk a little too much. And I know other people have sort of different thresholds for that, but that's where I stand. Uh, the question was, what, what patterns have I seen that would make a project a good fit for Mongo? The TV show project was actually a pretty good fit for Mongo. Just because all of the data was in one place, it didn't have links between it. Um, and I believe that project is still on Mongo, as far as I know. We did have one issue where uh, our product owner put something into the backlog that said, um, users should be able to click on an actor's name and see all of the TV shows that they've ever been in. Which is like, hmm. So we had been storing uh, the cast members basically as two strings, right? The actor name and the character name. So in order to compute this, we would have had to go into every single show, go into every single season, every single episode, go through the list of cast members and do string matching to find the same actor's name. Uh, and at this point, uh, I suggested maybe we should just link to IMDb. Um, <laughs> That didn't go over very well, but there's other ways to deal with that, right? So you can denormalize the data in different ways to get at that problem. But that was one of the signs that was like, oh, people are starting to ask for these links between documents. That's, and this isn't really designed for that. I actually think that it was mostly a mismatch between the type of data we had and the type of data that Mongo is good at. So I don't think it's necessarily a deficiency in Mongo. Uh, I think that Mongo is occasionally, I don't think, uh, probably not by the people that, that actually build it, but uh, I'm not sure. But it's occasionally oversold, I think. I think that a lot of people talk about Mongo as if it's a drop-in replacement for MySQL but it's really, really different. And it took me a while to figure that out. I think that, that Mongo is good at very different things than ActiveRecord and SQL in general. 
right? SQL is really good at joining things. Um, and so if, I, if, you're in a, if you're in a situation where you need to do these, these joins, uh, SQL is a great choice. Um, and Mongo is great if you have something where you can essentially denormalize a query into one place, right? So I think that a lot of it was just uh, our inexperience with Mongo and um, just a smaller community around the software around Mongo, which meant that we fixed a lot more bugs in our own mapping software than we would otherwise. Yeah. Why MySQL and not Postgres? Uh, we actually do support Postgres now. Um, at the time, I think it was just we wanted to uh, go to something that we had the most familiarity with. And we had the most familiarity with MySQL at the time. Um, and in the last month or so, we've, we've fixed up a bunch of stuff, and now we support Postgres as well, because we're planning on moving uh, our site over anyway. And, uh, but I think we're probably going to support MySQL and Postgres both moving forward. Yeah. The question is, what level of referencing, if any, um, would be acceptable in a document database? I think that um, it's, certainly, it's certainly possible to do, uh, even in the TV show project, we did have a few links between, uh, between things and references to things um, in the end. I think it's really hard to say, right? It, there's a certain amount that you, know, you do a couple of joins in your application code and you feel like, that's really an exceptional case. This is a feature that's kind of out there that we're not going to build a lot more of. I think that's one thing. And I think there just becomes a tipping point where you're like, OK, I've got all this code in my application that would be like one statement in Arrow, right? And it's an entire class that I had to test drive out the whole thing. And so there's, you know, you do that once, and you're like, OK, all right, this is not worth switching for. You do that twice. And it, I think it just, there, there's a certain tipping point you reach, and you'll know it when you get there. Sorry for the non-answer. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much.